Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's Reddit series video from the subreddit HFY called Chrysalis Chapter Three, written by Beaver Fur. Dowcat stared at his plate with a mix of fear and apprehension. The small meat-filled dumplings floated in a bright and dense orange soup, as if daring him to take another bite. He had made that mistake three minutes ago and was still trying to recover from the shivers. Numb mouth and itchy throat. Spicy. To call Zanvarian food spicy would be an understatement. No rajan sauce was spicy. Lanshi tree melons were spicy. But this, this was a health hazard past off his food. He pushed the square plate a few inches away and took another sip from his drink, bracing for the impact of the deep, bitter taste. He cursed himself again for listening to the Naksani's advice when ordering his food. He was still trying to figure out whether his new boss's suggestions had been honest ones, or if he'd been prank playing on the ignorance of the Zimbarian cuisine. Knowing her? Probably both. Dowcat leaned back in his chair and gazed at his surroundings. The hall of the four columns was one of the most luxurious rooms in the Zinvar's Imperium Palace, with tall ceilings engraved with hieroglyphics of gold and jade that told the history of the Empire-turned-Republic. The ceiling was supported by columns, four massive pillars of glass that shone with their own pulsating light, bathing the room in a green glow. And dwarfed by the columns, the guests dined, drank, and mingled. The elite of the Zinver Republic, admirals and tribe leaders, politicians and powerful businessmen. They talked in pairs and groups, walking around tables and servants, joking loudly with each other. Playing with a steel pincer that served as a food utensil, Dowcat wished that once more that he was anywhere but here. A few months ago, he had a promising career laid out in front of him as a high-ranking consulate delegate at one of the core worlds in the Galactic Federal Council. But somehow, in a turn of events that he hadn't even begun to really understand, he had ended up here, deep ass end of the Orion Arm, eating Zinvarian dumplings. He looked back at the guests and saw his own boss amongst them. Natstani was the midst of it all, confidently talking to the Imperial himself. Ambassador Natstani was a Galactic Federal Council was an odd piece. Like himself, she was a Sangsian coming from one of the oldest worlds in the Galactic Council, a lush and peaceful agrarian planet that lived mostly out of tourism. Sangsians were nimble beings in thin bodies, large eyes and smooth silvery skins, known for being polite and diligent. But where Dalkat himself was a good example of the stereotype, his boss was anything but. Nascani acted like she was a local herself, laughing with intensity, slapping the shoulder of whoever she was talking to, drinking and sampling every food. At first, Dalkat had found a contrast between her behavior and her delicate looks to be striking, but it seemed to be working on the Zinvarians, and they treated her with respect. The other reason, of course, was her role. As a representative of the council, Nakstani might not have had a fleet of her own like some of the admirals in the room, but she had influence in spades, the kind of influence that came from representing an organization that covered for 40% of the known galaxy. As Darkat watched his boss bow to the emperor and walk back to their table, she plopped down on the seat in front of him and eyed the discarded plate. Hey kid, aren't you going to eat that? She asked, already reaching for the pincer. No, Dalkat answered. In fact, I suspect the sauce might be laced with some sort of hallucinogenic. She tilted her head, looking curiously at the dumpling before stuffing it into her mouth. Mmm, yeah. Yeah, I think it is. Dalkat looked at her and shook his head. Really? How can you eat that? Ah, it's not that bad. Besides, nobody's going to tell you their secrets if you aren't willing to try their food first. He nodded. Secrets. Right, I guess that's true. She stopped chewing and stared at him for a few seconds with an inquisitorial gaze. Then he sighed. All right, spit it out. What? Whatever it is, it's got you yellow teeth. Look, I thought you wanted this position, to be here, an assistant ambassador. But obviously, there's something you don't like. Spit it out already. Darkat blinked at the brashness of the question. In his mind, ambassadors were supposed to be tactful and discreet. He wondered whether it would be a good idea to answer truthfully, but there weren't many ways in which he could further be punished. It wasn't like he could be sent off to an even less pleasant destination than the Zinvo Republic. Yes, he admitted, I did want to be in an assistant position, just not here. 
I applied for the Nayatin Prime, but it seems someone upstairs wanted to punish me by sending me to this, um... Dark had stopped at the bewildered look on the boss was giving him. You think you were punished? Ah, oh, sure. What other reason would they have to send me here, as far away into the periphery as possible? Nakstani was pressing a laugh. Oh, you cursed fool. They sent you here because I specifically asked for you. Dalkut's eyes membranes did a funny twitch. You did what? Why? She stuffed another dumpling into her mouth. Because I read your examination essay, the one where you were talked about making a difference, because I thought you'd want to be in someplace important. I was going someplace important. I like the core worlds. Not here. I see. Nayatin Prime, she asked. Well, yes. Nayatin Prime is where the High Governance is based out of. It's where all the Grand Ministers are. All the action is there. She snorted. Bull crap. Dalcat was about to reply when she interrupted him, leaning forward and speaking in a lower tone. No. Listen to me now, Dalcat. Nayatin Prime, it's bull crap. Yes, all the big wigs are there. All the celebrities. They get together, throw some large party some charity fundraiser, or something to appear in the network vids and get the ten minutes of fame. All the while, you are left to send the invites. You go there, you turn into a glorified paper pusher. He shook his head, raising his voice. Nathan Prime is where the Fifth Accords were signed, for crying out loud. Where they were signed? Sure. But where do you think they were negotiated? She motioned to the hall around them and the pincer in her hand. It was in a room like this. This is the frontier, kid. This is where the rubber meets the road, where the real action is. That next volume of the history lessons. That next wall that'll shape the destiny of entire worlds. It starts here, in this room, right now. She eyed a couple of high rankings and varian officers as they passed her table. Might have already started, in fact, she added. The revelation had left our cat paused, not knowing how to react. It was Naksani who was saying true. Not only had he hadn't been punished in the first place, but he'd been hand-picked for her for an important position. One that wouldn't take him in front of the cameras, but maybe for important nonetheless. He didn't have time to feel like an idiot, though. If she said was true, he had to get his peak in the game. The last sentence had piqued his interest. Do you mean the reports were true? The Zinvarian fleet is mobilizing. She nodded, stealing a sip of his drink. The third fleet is in port two weeks ago. The first and fourth both left three days ago. It seems like the Zinva Republic is going to war. Crap. Offensive or defensive? She tilted her head and smiled at him. You tell me, kid. A test. But Dark had knew that what she meant. She had explained it the day before. There was a certain feeling to these meetings, an emotional energy in the air, in the way that people acted, in the way that they talked and moved. He just had to know how to read it between the lines. He looked around discreetly. The Zimvarians appeared relaxed, joking and drinking. He saw a group of tribe leaders burst into a raucous laughter, slapping each other's shoulders. Except it looked a bit over the top. As he stared at more intently, he started to notice the little details, the underlying patterns. The emperor was talking to everyone, but he never stayed far from his own guards. The tribe leaders were joking, but their reaction seemed false, as if their attention was someplace else. The admirals were all in their own little group, taking in a hasty tones, discussing war strategies, maybe. Nakstani was examining him. So? Defensive. We're all spooked, Dalcat said. Ah, I knew there was a reason I hide you, after all. Go on. They are projecting the image of strength, he elaborated, but they are nervous at the same time. It's all a facade. They are worried about something, but don't want to look like they are weak. And what do you think could cause that? Dalkat thought for a minute. Internal strife? Coup attempt, maybe? Nakstani shook her head. I don't think so. All factions are represented here. Whatever it is, they're all in it together. So an external enemy, he concluded. She nodded. If you ask me, I think someone's seen a bush cat lurking around, and they're all circling the plumps now. The what now? The plumps. The glass munchers. The cows? He ventured. Yes, the cows. Seriously. Haven't you ever been in a long grazing? No, Dakat replied. I was raised in George City. Ah, a cursed urbanite. That explains a thing or two about you. Anyways, yes, an external enemy. They have been attacked. He nodded, and the more he thought about it, the clearer it was. 
An external menace was the only thing that could have united the different tribes and factions that made up the Zinva higher social layer. It would be a good motivation to put their differences aside for the time being. But still, there was something still didn't fit. So why not just ask for help, Dalcat said. The Zinva Republic is an associate state of the council. Per their cause, we are obliged to support them in their defense of war against an external aggressor. The Nakstani smiled. That's the question, isn't it? What do you think? Dalcat paused and reviewed what he knew about the Republic, the power structure and the internal issues, trying to look at the question for a new angle. It's political. Asking for help now would make the ruling tribe seem weak and hurt their chances at keeping the emperor position in elections next year. Hmm, you are learning, but no, that wouldn't explain why all the other factions are keeping their mouths shut as well. Then why? He asked, but before she could reply, he continued speaking his thoughts. I mean, if there's a message of strength and not directed at one of the factions, then who else is there, Archer, that... uh, He paused as he considered who else was in the room. Themselves. That was it. Clear as day. A message of strength, of unity, directed at the Galactic Federal Council. At them, too. The Republic was going to war. The Galactic Council knew. The Republic knew that they knew, and they were delivering their message. Keep your snouts out of our business. The entire dinner was a farce, a play, and they, too, were the center of it. He felt a shiver down his spine as he imagined the gaze of every dinner guest in the room staring down his back, scrutinizing his every gesture. The Naktsani's behavior, drinking, joking, talking to everyone, it had been another message, a reply of her own. No. As he considered the implications, Naktsani leaned towards him and spoke with a smile. Ah, now you see it. Why, you should have eaten your cursed dumplings. Dalkat nodded slowly, still frozen and with his hands laid flat on the table. His heart was beating fast. So this is what the infamous game played like. The real stuff, threats and bluffs masquerading as jokes and spicy sauces. Ironic that he wanted to be someplace important and now he was just right at the heart of a burgeoning conflict. The crucial signs had all gone over his head. At last, he rose his gaze and looked back at his boss, who had an amused expression on her face. They're hiding something, Dark Hat said. They don't want us to interfere because there's something they don't want us to know. Nectani's smile transformed into a predatory grin, one that somehow didn't look out of place with her delicate features. And doesn't that, she said, make you just a little bit curious? She was right, of course. He was curious. The Zinva Republic had been attacked, but they were trying to hide it. Why? Because there must be something, some critical piece of information that they wanted to keep secret. Something that could have been tremendous consequences if divulged. We need to learn who is behind it, Dalgat said. Who is attacking them? Agreed, which is why you have been meeting in about ten minutes with them. Um, She paused for a moment and Dalgat could see a bright yellow lines appear in her eyes as she connected to her augmented irises. One Corvette Captain Avamar of the Burplen Plane. Dalgat blinked. You've got a mall. Sorry, stupid question. Of course you've got a mall. And you've got a meeting, third level, in Eastern Terrace. I suggest you get going, Dakstani said as she laid back in her seat, drink in hand. Don't worry, I'll stay here and hold the fort. Right, he said as he was already standing up. Walking out the hall, he left the felt stiff and his movements rigid. He concentrated on keeping regular, normal-looking pace, not too anxious or too slow that it would look deliberate. He tried avoiding the gazes of the other guests without looking like he was shunning them. It was harder than it seemed. The terrace, a large expanse of marble overlooking the palace's lush gardens, was an empty when Dalkat arrived. He walked past the bronze statue depicting a long-dead military heroes, each with a small placard underneath telling their stories which tribe they belonged to, which long-forgotten battles they had fought. Entire lives summed up in three-sentence-long blurbs. He paused at the edge of the balcony, placing his hands on the intricately decorated stone handrail. As night, the gardens surrounding the palace were plunged into shadows, and it looked as if the building was surrounded by pure blackness, like a small boat in the stone floating in a sea of nothingness. And beyond the black expanse, he could see the myriad of lights of the city of Zinverian capital covering the horizon. 
the traffic crawling towards the spaceport, the twin avenues, the spiraling towers that the powerful Anakax tribe had built for the commercial district. In a way, it was fitting that this palace represented the old imperial age was separated from a more modern city, symbol of an ascent into stellar economy. Ever since they arrived, Darkat had always been aware of the sense of melancholic dissidence impregnating everything related to Zinver's imperial past. But there were high hopes for the Republic. Back at the Core Worlds, it was unexpected that the Zinverians would be ready to apply for membership to the Galactic Council in about 50 years. Nakstani's and their couch job was not to be act as representatives, but to gently steer the policy makers in the right direction to make sure that the remaining political reforms would take place before that happened. He was optimistic, but sadly, the Republic hadn't completely recovered from the shock of the military disaster that had lost them their empire, and a sense of fatalism mixed with compensation of self-importance still lingered. He feared that a war at this delicate moment could jeopardize everything. His augmented irises warned him of approaching figure even before his own could ever register it. A Zinvarian, he waited for the local to approach, enabling the recording function of his irises. He was still thinking of an opening line when the Zinvarian spoke with a thick, glattural accent. Nah, the deceptive lizard doesn't dream me worthy of a time, so she sends a lackey, yes? Daukat tensed his jaw and a large creature approached. No matter how much time he spent in this planet, there would always be a part of his primordial brain sounding the alarms whenever a Zinvarian was close some sort of evolutive survival response. When he was a small animal running from a predator across the grass fields of his homeworld, galactic politics wasn't about who was bigger or stronger, but about who had the most influence and leverage. And that was him. Corvette Captain Avermer, Alcat said with confident smile, My name is Dalcat, I'm Assistant Ambassador. Next Danny sends her apologies. She couldn't excuse herself from the dinner party, but I can assure you I can speak on her behalf. Avermer made a sort of puffing sound, the tentacles in front of his mouth raising slightly. Just ask what you want. Dalcat nodded. Very well. We would like to know why this Inverium fleet is mobilizing. You are with the first, correct? Yes, we are mobilizing to response to an attack. That was it. Confirmation that Dalcat had to repress a smile. What happened? he asked. This Inverium took a few seconds to reply. Dalcat was about to repeat the question when he started speaking. Two months ago, we lost contact with a group of resource-scanning ships in one of the uninhabited external systems. Two days later, the squadron sent their search was lost too, followed by an attack against an advanced frontier outpost. He paused again, as if he was trying difficulty getting the words out. We attempted several incursions to retake control of the system, all of which were repelled. Four weeks ago, the entire 6th Fleet gathered and the closest neighboring star in order to lead a massive counterattack but they were surprised by the enemy before they could put plan into motion. There were no survivors. Dalkan let out a breath as he processed this information. You're telling me you've got already lost an entire fleet, an entire fleet and a star system? Avermer huffed. No, we have lost two fleets and three systems, he corrected. All of the systems were unpopulated, but judging by the advance of the attackers, we expect them to reach our first inhabited planets in less than a week. The remaining fleets are mobilizing to protect the colony. Where? Which colony? Njovert. Dalcat nodded. He had read about that planet before, with two million settlers already. It was one of the most promising newly claimed worlds, and the Republic was investing a good amount of resources in its development. One more thing, he said. Who is attacking you, and why? The Zinvarian bobbed his head, slow and deliberate. Hmm. You've heard the plain proverb, Rias. He had, yes, pain breeds pain, pain breeds pain. There is no escape from the ghosts of our own past. We must fight the wars that our forefathers so. Dalcat repressed a sigh. The last thing he wanted now was a lesson in Zivarian fatalism, on how every disgrace, ranging from disease to earthquakes, was somehow the fault of their ancestors. So, you mean... He started. I'm not a traitor, Avamar interrupted. I told you all mastered that. What I do, I do it because it's righteous, yes? Dalcat nodded. The tribes are wrong to hide what might affect our council. It's not proper to deny others the right to know their fate. But know that you know I'm not obliged anymore, yes? 
The Zinvarian was already turning to leave. Wait, who is attacking you? The Arkad asked. Does the ghost have a name? Yes. The Avamir, without turning back. The Terran. He walked away with that, leaving Dalcat alone again in silence. He stood there, processing the information. Finally, he opened the line back to Naxtani, who sent her recording to her irises. Got that? He asked her, subvocalizing the voice message. He heard a response directly right in his ears. Yes, she said. Not much. Never heard of those Terrans before, but at least now we know where the fleets are going to. The colony world, Yovit. Any ideas of what should we do next? The line went silent for a few seconds, and he started walking back towards the dining hall. Eventually, his boss spoke again. Um, Dalcat, she said, didn't you say you were from an agricultural world? He frowned at the question. What was she playing at? They were both from the same world, so of course she already knew, and just then, he realized the hidden message. Despite himself, Dalcat had to smile. Ah, sure I am, he said, playing along. And ever since I've got you, I've been curious about the Zinvarian agricultural techniques and farming policies. Like, say, the ones they use on the colony worlds. Oh, really? Well, in that case, we should make an official visit to one of them. I've heard Yovet is lovely this time of year. I guess that we could leave tomorrow morning. That would be great, Nuxtari. I can't wait to see how the Zinvarians deal with their plumps. End of chapter. Chrysalis Chapter 4, written by Beaverfur I entered the living room carrying a blanket on my right arm. It was a wooden, hand-knitted patchwork of green, brown, and blue colors. It hung from my arm, weighing it down, skimming right over the wooden boarded floor that without ever dragging on it. I walked slowly, deliberately. There was a certain ritualistic approach to my movements. There had to be. The living room was lit in an orange glow coming through a single window, bathed in the colors of the Sunday afternoon, the dying of the day casting long shadows across the floor, across the table and the couch. I paused briefly in front of the brown couch, then turned on my feet and sat on it, placing the blanket on the seat next to me. Slowly, I leaned sideways and rested my head on the armrest. After a beat, I rose my legs up and placed them on the couch too. I lay there, my body sprawled across the three seats. Of course, the piece of furniture wasn't as long as the bed, so I had to keep my knees somewhat bent to fit in. The posture created a bit of a strain in the artificial musculature that covered my legs, but it was supposed to do that. It was supposed to be ever so slightly uncomfortable, but not unpleasant enough that I would need to move and change posture. With a precise movement, I unfolded the blanket and covered my body with it, from the legs and up to my chest. I doubted for a moment whether I placed my arms over or under the blanket, unsure as to which was the correct way to go about it. The perfect resting posture. Eventually, I left them uncovered. The TV in front of the couch was turned on, broadcasting some old show I hadn't watched before, the images having that noisy grain and dated them that sometime during the 80s. Of course, it's not that I didn't know the name of the show, or its length, or the actual airing of its 28 episodes. The one now playing on TV was the sixth. The name and date and birth of each of the leading actors, or where I'd found the tapes television archive building in what had been the city of Atlanta, one that I'd completely digitized before leaving Earth. But I tried to shy away from that knowledge, pretending that I didn't know it all, pretending that I had just turned on the TV and this is what happened to be on it. It wasn't working, not fully, but it was as close as I dared go, short of intentionally deleting that knowledge from my databanks. Had I eyelids, I would have half closed them by now, the body I was controlling just another one of my robotic soldiers, and I hadn't designed them to be so purpose in mind. I could have turned off its two cameras, but it wouldn't have felt the same so I simply adjusted the focus until the image had gotten them was slightly blurry. It would have to do. All of this, of course, was a crude mockery, a doomed attempt at recapturing a memory, a feeling again that sense of warmth, of calmness, that came with spending a Sunday afternoon lying on the sofa, balancing in that narrow sweet spot between awareness and sleep. Except things were somewhat off. The room felt different somehow, though I couldn't quite put my finger on what was wrong. 
Was the ceiling just a bit too tall, too short? How many inches had the TV screen had? How many feet had separated it from the couch? It felt as if someone had ran through my stuff and put everything out of place. I could tell things were wrong, but the memories weren't precise enough, clear enough, as to know how to fix the same mistakes. I knew the couch's fabric had to have some sort of faded pattern, but I couldn't for the life of me recall what it had looked like. But those glaring holes in my memory was the other presence that had been there with me. I knew I hadn't been alone when resting like this, drifting off to sleep. Someone had sat with me on the same couch. I recalled the jokes. I recalled someone massaging my legs. And yet, I couldn't recall their face, their looks, who they had been. I knew that person had been important, but not why. This... The whole experience was an exercise in frustration, in trying to reach at something that was always moving away, that slipping through my fingers the moment I thought I had a grasp on it, but it was important that I kept trying. It grated on me that most of the vital memories, the ones trying to put back humanity, were also the most blurred ones, the most imprecise, and the most filled with gaps. All the while, I could construct a perfect replica of the Zimbarian laser projector, down to identifying serial codes in each electronic board. I was constructing them at this very moment, in fact, 416 of them to join my other 2,379 projectors that I had already installed in drones and crafts across my feet. I had been busy. Even as I lay on the sofa, purposely not watching the TV, my awareness kept working on several simultaneous levels. I could see the outside of the living room, a plywood construction that I had erected inside one of the smaller storage areas in my main body. I could see the space surrounding me, my extending panels bathed in the faint orange light of the twin stars at the center of the lumen system. I was aware of the more than seven million machines that now composed my swarm. They were distributed across the stellar system under my command, most of the drones tasked with different kinds of resource extraction, minerals, radioactive materials, gases, waters, all the work, and the extraction, transportation, refining, and construction of new units controlled by a central servers in my main body, instantaneously transmitting commands both through the EM spectrum and via my new quantum entangled relays. I become a nation of a single mind. Paradoxically, I had the Zinvo Republic to thank for my exponential growth. It was the fusion of plants and their own design that satisfied the increasing energy appetite of the swarm. It was their communication devices that optimized processing algorithms that allowed my brain to coordinate so many machines. It was their warp engines that enabled me to expand beyond Earth's solar system. And more importantly, it was their past actions, their attack on Earth, that still fueled my determination. They had been aggressive at first, sending their warship squadrons after me, but they hadn't put a strong enough front, maybe not considering me an important threat, so it had been hard to come out ahead. Then they wised up, sending a strong and coordinated attack force to face me. Had they done that in the beginning, they could have won, but by the time they had reacted, I was already strong enough to stomp on their forces. After that, the Zinvarians had shifted to a defensive stance, no doubt grouping around the nearest colony world. It would fall on me to start the next confrontation. All around me, my attack swarms gathered, more than 400,000 offensive drones and assault soldiers. There were so many of them that they looked like a moving fluid. The machines danced and flowed in tight, fractal formations, following complex patterns that weave them together without ever crashing into each other. They enveloped me like a living metallic blanket, like some sort of twisted mirroring of what was one happening inside the plywood room. There were so many of them that it was impossible for me to stuff them into my body anymore. Transportation and non-malfunctioning now marked the limits of my attack strength, so I had resorted to building a support carrier ships. At roughly two kilometers long each, and support ship featured a miniaturized version of my own body design with compartments for carrying drones and soldiers, but also assembly factories, raw material storage areas, shield projectors, power plants, laser weaponry, and warp drives. The only thing missing was a mind of their own. Just like the drones themselves, the support ships were under my direct control, an extension of myself rather than a separate entities. 
That was another of the boundaries, another line that I wasn't willing to cross. I wouldn't give self-awareness to what I intended to use as a mere weapon of war. Like the drones, the support ships were disposable too, which meant that I couldn't just send a swarm to attack while I stayed at put behind, safe within my controlled territories. Even the quantum relays weren't perfect, their bandwidth was limited, and if I tried directly to control a complex interwoven movement of hundreds of thousands of drones through them, there would be several seconds of delay before my orders reached the recipients, a delay that could cost me a battle. No, I would need to be in the front lines directing the machine's movements with precision, risking my own body. I guess I could have built a backup servers in my stellar systems, though, some sort of failsafe, a clone of my mind that would persist even if my main body was destroyed. It would be a smart thing to do, the optimal, but I didn't like it. The idea of my consciousness being some fluid thing, the idea of losing contact by mistake and coming back to find out another me had taken over. Stupid, perhaps. I knew I was putting obstacles in my own way, deliberately falling short of my full potential. But I felt I needed this, these uh, anchors, to prevent me from going down an ever-dangerous slope. Vengeance was important, but so was remaining human, not losing myself, because as long as I did, as long as I could keep me from becoming something else, then humanity itself would exist with me. There would be a faint glimmer of hope, as long as I was human, and then we would not be extinct. So I couldn't afford to be consumed, to turn into a mindless weapon of mass destruction. That didn't mean that I planned to die anytime soon, though. I had upgraded my body, improved its armor with the new material techniques I had developed, installed shield projectors based on the Severian designs, and a warp drive that was currently charging for the imminent faster-than-light trip. I commanded the support ships to spool their warp drives too. Turned that warp tunneling was dependent on mass. The bigger the objects, the more power it required. And having to move 27 kilometer long object, the warp drive of my main body had some crazy energy requirements. It took my power plant several minutes to feed it before each activation. I felt nervous as I secured the last of my drones in their compartments. As I sent the orders to the factories and the other machines, I was leaving behind would follow in my absence. It was always like this before a trip, but this time I knew it would be harder. I would be jumping straight into a battlefield, into an enemy trap. Stealing myself, I activated my warp drives. Right away, I went blind and deaf, losing contact with the rest of my machines. I was now only aware of the drones within my own body. There was no way to communicate to the external world while in a warp. It made me feel small. I was just getting used to my expanded awareness, the being present across different stellar systems, to the almost omniscient view I had over my domains. This going back to a constraints of a single view, the physical limits of a single ship, felt almost like being caged. I made me feel anxious and vulnerable, the trip would only take 20 minutes, but to the rest of the universe more than three days would have passed by the time I emerged back into normal space. I was all too aware of how defenseless my other machines would be during this time. They had their orders and were autonomous enough to not stop in their tracks. But I couldn't kid myself. Should the Zinvarians choose to attack my solar system now, my drones would be an easy prey without myself to direct them. It spoke volumes of why the Zinvarian fleets moved the way they did, continuously making short warp jumps rather than long leaps, like stones skipping on a lake surface, always popping in and out of warp to avoid unpleasant surprises. Sadly, I just wasn't a viable strategy for me. With my massive vehicle, each FDL ticket was an expensive investment with a long setup, making too many of them would be prohibitive. There just wasn't anything I could do other than wait, cross my fingers, and hope that I wouldn't come out of a warp to find my home raised and burned, so to speak. So I waited, going over the possible attack plans and flying patterns. Meanwhile, in the living room, I shifted my body to relieve the strain of my legs. Leaving warp was as sudden as entering it had been. One moment I was blind, and the next I could see. Millions of machines popping into my awareness, petrobytes of information being downloaded into my brain as the pending logs finally reached me. 
my mind started working, shifting through the enormous pile of data, discarding irrelevant information and integrating the important bits into my memory banks. To my conscious mind, it felt as if I'd never left. I had perfect recollection of everything that had happened in my absence. All the while, I perfectly remembered being in warp, unable to communicate. It was yet another of the oddities of my strange new nature. I went through my memories in the last three days. A couple factories had stopped production due to running out of input materials. Seventeen drones had been destroying a pipe collapse in the Centauri system, and more than 4,000 others had landed in their respective home hangars after entering maintenance problems of some kind or the other. Nothing to worry about. I absentmindedly sent the command to deal with each situation and focus my attention on the immediate surroundings. The colony world floated at 80,000 kilometers away from me, a sphere of green, brown, and blue hues. Its bright, colorful tones contrasted with the pure black of space, making it stand out like a floating jewel. It was beautiful. It only served to make me angrier. That it was just like Earth had once looked, that the Zinvarians had enjoyed this safe, beautiful world even after having wrecked ours. The crimes didn't have any repercussions, that the universe, that life itself kept going on in spite of our tragedy, that we had been forgotten. No, that would not do. In orbit, right between the planet and my own position, there was a Zenvarian fleet, with 13 battleships and their escorting vessels. It was the largest combined fleet that I had ever faced so far, and they had indeed wised up. The warship groups were arrayed in a large arching formation, leaving tens of kilometers of empty space between each other, making sure I noticed that I wouldn't be able to warp them all in and tick the swarm at the same time. The enemy started to react, turning their flanks towards me, but they hadn't opened fire yet. Holding formation, they showered me in a message, transmissions asking for a truce or a negotiation. I gave those same treatment that humanity's own pleas had been given. I weighed my options. Their plan, I realized, was both simple and hard to counter. If I tried to attack them all at the same time, my machines would be too dispersed to be effective. That meant that I would need to work my way through the ships instead, one after another. But focusing my strength on a single ship would free the other enemies to flank me and shoot both me and my drones from a safety of distance, using the greater range of their energy weapons. Could I win this? Yes. Maybe. My own body was now protected by shields specifically designed to withstand laser fire, and even though the drones were vulnerable, at the end of the day, I had advantage of numbers. A very large advantage of numbers. So probably I would have enough drones to work through their entire fleet ship by ship to come out victorious, but the losses would be astonishing. Most of it, not all my machines would be destroyed in the process. My body would need repairs. I could win, but... uh, would that be a worthwhile victory, or just a losing strategy, one that made me weaker for the long run, unable to survive some critical juncture in the future? I could just ignore the warships and dive in for the kill, send all my swarm to ravage the world that they were tossed and protecting. They wouldn't be able to stop me. But then what? After I destroyed their world, I would still need to face off their warships. Running away wasn't an option, given how long my warp drive took to charge, and I'd put it into a worse tactical position, having already committed my army to a ground attack. What other options were there? Sending a couple drones armed with nuclear warheads towards each of their ships? No, it would be obvious, and the machines would be shut down long before they could reach their targets. Using nuclear drones was a collaborative task. One craft delivered a payload while the rest proved cover and chaos and decoys. But again, trying to do that simultaneously against all enemy ships would be disperse my swarm too thinly. It was still defeating. So, yes, the Zenvarian strategy was simple, but hard to counter. We stood there for a few seconds of standoff, facing each other, not talking on my part, no radio communications. Three seconds later, I was joined by my eight support ships, popping out into normal space by my side. Ah. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, please consider supporting the author from the link down below. Otherwise, if you wish to support this channel, there are numerous ways to do so, like liking, subscribing, and possibly even becoming a patron. 
Otherwise, the easiest way would be to share. And until the next video, I hope that you all have a good one, and I'll see you then. Cheers.